This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today I've got a special treat for you because I will be talking to Darren Dalton. You all know him as Randy Anderson in The Outsiders, that 1983 Francis Ford Coppola uh, teen gang classic that had so many great, uh, great legends in it. Um, so many great stars, Patrick Swayze, C. Thomas Howell, Ralph Macchio, Emilio Estevez, Tom Cruise, Matt Dillon. Man, it's a great movie. It's got a great cast. And, um, yeah, he was one of the socias. I mean, wow, they were all greasers, you know, he was one of the socias with, uh, Leif Garrett and Glenn Withrow. And, uh, he was also in, uh, National Lampoon's Joy of Sex. He will be... My, let's see, how many guests have I had from that movie? Seven. He'll be my seventh guest from that movie. And he'll be my third guest from John Milius' Red Dawn. And um, he's also been on a lot of episodic television, like Highway to Heaven, Freddy's Nightmares, Quantum Leap, Alienation, and so forth. I'm going to talk about all that stuff today, and I cannot wait. Also, rest in peace, David Crosby. Go and listen to his 2016 interview on WTF with Mark Marin. I remember when I first heard it, it was a Thursday, and I was at the San Carlos Library, and I just I was moved by it. About 52 minutes in, they talk about Woodstock, and it gave me such chills when I listened to it. And I'm not going to spoil it for you. Go listen. It's a great interview. God, David Crosby, folk rock icon and pioneer also at midnight tonight it will be eight years since my rebirth on that cold ominous day and night i was given the promised land and here i am and i thank you my creator my family and i thank all of you for listening day after day so yeah, here is my interview with Darren Dalton. Hello. Hey Darren, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm good. I'm. I, I hope you can hear me okay. I'm actually in the. I'm. I'm on the L.A. freeway. So brought to you by the L.A. freeway. I hear you just fine. <laughs> this is a, good. Such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Oh man. I love, I love, I love, uh, love checking in with people. I'm, I'm digging it. Awesome. So going back in time, I was reading that uh, you had a rock band in high school called Regression. Were you originally on the trajectory of music before acting? You know, absolutely. I was kind of on, and even at one point, kind of on the dual track. I loved playing music. Regression was an interesting uh, band because it it originally formed as just uh, street harmonies. Mm-hmm. You know, just. Uh, there were like six of us that were doing just street harmonies. And then, of course, somebody brought a set of drums, and then somebody brought a guitar, and then before you know it, we were, you know, playing Rush. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm a huge Rush fan. I got to see them on their last tour before they retired, and they were awesome. Um, is that who you listened to growing up, mostly hard rock? You know what? I grew up in the mountains of Wyoming, so, you know, it, you had to, like, be pretty loud to get up there. And so it was a lot of Kiss and a lot of Rush and a lot of... Uh, you know, and, and, you know, some journey and some things like that thrown in as well. Uh, and then, and then, you know, it's interesting because then I got on the outsiders and that kind of opened doors for me. I remember walking into a hotel room where we were all having a, you know, Friday night gathering after, uh, one of the rehearsal days and Ralph Macchio had put on darkness on the edge of town by Springsteen. Right. And that changed my life. Then I was like, Oh my God, this is, I, you know, this is, this, this is my jam. So kind of started growing a little bit more outward and music wise and stuff. But, but you know, my brother is a fantastic uh, guitarist. My older brother, Mm -hmm. he's actually playing. um, He's actually one of the guitarists uh, with C Thomas in his current country, country uh, uh, band that's touring right now. And so, uh, you know, he was, he was the guitarist. For a while, I played bass till we got a bass player. I was basically just fronting and doing the, doing the singing, doing the songwriting. And it was a great outlet for poetry. I was, a, you know, I was a young man. I, I was poetic. I wanted to write poetry and, you know, 
make a girl yeah. swoon and stuff like that. And, and rock, music was the way to do it. Yeah, I think uh, most guys get into music because it, because it attracts girls, you know. <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go. It was also just, the, you know, listen, there's, n- there's nothing more fun than a garage band. Mm-hmm. There really isn't. It's like that was just the most fun you could have at that time. It was so, such a blast. And, and you know, one of the reasons we played groups like Rush is because it was challenging, but also because we didn't have a PA system. So you didn't really need vocals, mm-hmm. you know. And, yeah. and we ultimately got a singer, and we, and the first time we played live, we played at a talent show, and we played some ACDC. I think we played Back in Black. Uh, and it was the first time we heard the singer sing, and we realized that the singer couldn't actually sing, so that was, that was eye-opening. Oh, <laughs> that's awesome. So how do you get cast as Randy Anderson in The Outsiders? It's, it's an interesting thing, because I was doing, you know, I grew I. My family moved from Wyoming, where I spent the first 14 years of my life, and we moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I got into uh, a, uh, a great high school that was uh, had a great um, uh, drama program. I kind of got into the drama program through the stagecraft side of it. I wanted to design sets and do those things, and so I signed up for a stagecraft class, and then ultimately for one production, it was a production of Romeo and Juliet, they didn't have enough people to uh, to play the roles, so they asked me to read for one of the roles. And 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 once I got, you know, although I was I was pretty frightened by the whole experience, I loved it, you know, and yeah. uh, um, I loved being on stage. And so I kind of set myself on the idea that I wanted to go to New York and go get on Broadway. I loved the stage experience and things, but. I had two friends of mine that were there that were involved in drama that had it a little more together than me. They had an agent there in town and they asked me to give them a ride to the auditions. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, 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 I didn't know what it was for. It was just, they, they said, my, our agent said, you know, we have an, an audition at the Hilton. Uh, you know, there's going to be a bunch of people from Albuquerque there. And so I drove them there and I was waiting in the hallway and mm-hmm. Janet Hershenson, who was the casting director, uh, stepped out of the room and pointed at me and said, you, you should come in, too. And yeah. so I did. And I went into the room and, and uh, met Fred Roos, who was there, and Janet was there. And I think I read, I, I think we all read the, uh, one of the, you know, like the end monologue from Johnny, you know, mm-hmm. as he's dying. And yeah. uh, anyway, long story short, I got a call back ultimately there in Albuquerque the, you know, the next day. And then I got another call back to go fly out to Los Angeles. Um, the two friends that I had given the ride to didn't get the call back. So I, you know, I took some heat there, but, um, and then another call back to Los Angeles and then ultimately a third call back to New York. Um, wow. and it was, it was a very intense process. It wasn't like an audition process that I've experienced since. Yeah, uh, and so the, it was since it being the first one, I thought they were all going to be like that. But it was, it was. I didn't realize how special it was. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a process where, you know, when when they flew me out the first time to Los Angeles, um, you, you know, we go into a big. It was at Zoetrope Studios, which is is no longer there, but it's it's another studio now. But we go into the uh, onto the lot, and the, you know, I'm getting closer to. Uh, to the uh, sound stage that they're taking us to, and I can hear opera coming from it. Mm. And uh, and I go in there, and there's you know a hundred young men hanging out. And I thought my thinking was it was going to be a bunch of unknowns like myself. Mm-hmm. And but it was everybody that I knew from television. It was the Scott Bayos and the you know Doug McKeons and all these people were there. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and we all watched each other audition and. Francis, I met I met Coppola there, and he just assigned us roles. He just said, you know, here's the script that you know we're going to do an improv- improvisation, or we're going to do this scene. You know, turn the page to this scene. You're going to play Derry. You're going to play Soda Pop, and things like that. And uh, mm-hmm. I never really read the role that I ended up getting mm-hmm. in the in the auditions, but uh, um, it, it progressed. You know, the first two there in Los Angeles were just. You know, you spent the whole day there. You had pizza. I was able to see, you know, Mickey Rourke and some of these just amazing actors uh, do their work. So it was a real learning experience on how to audition, too. 
Yeah. And then the final callback in New York was a little different because they isolated two of us for each role. And, uh, and then they had each of us read half of the script in a complete script read through at a, in a recording studio. So Coppola was recording the script itself, which ultimately I found out he was, was kind of doing in a, you know, like a, like a animated storyboard and just basically animated the movie before he made it. And, uh, so he could, you know, get an idea of how he wanted to do it. And, uh, I was reading the role of Dallas at that time. So I read half the script as Dallas. And of course, when I went there and I saw that Matt Dillon was there, uh, I was like, well, this, this, this role's him. It's him, you know? Mm -hmm. And so this has been fun, but I, I'll just do my thing and go back to Albuquerque. And, uh, you know, it took a, took a good, like, six weeks or so after that audition for them to call back and offer the part of Randy Anderson. And I, you know, I immediately grabbed the script and went through it and went, oh, this is, there's stuff here. This is, this is fantastic. So that's how it started. Wow. Yeah, Coppola had just had a huge flop with One from the Heart, and next he was developing both The Outsiders and Rumblefish at the same time. He, he was reading like every young actor in Hollywood for this movie, you know. I know you mentioned uh, Scott Baio. I also read uh, there was Anthony Michael Hall and Timothy Hutton and even his own nephew, oh, Nick, yeah. Nicholas Cage. Every, everybody was there. Yeah, Tim Hutton. I mean, everybody was there, you know, and, yeah. and there weren't a lot of unknown faces. You know, but uh, but it it was just such an amazing experience, you know, mm -hmm. and and most of the cast were there in Los Angeles. I met, you know, Emilio, I met C. Thomas, I met uh, Tom and, you know, met most of those people. Uh, you know, I didn't meet Matt until New York. Um, uh, and I don't I don't think Ralph was there until New York either. Yeah. And, uh, um and but I mean, for the most part, there were a lot of there were people that read for it, but I, I could tell right away from the start that C. Thomas was pretty much the front runner for Pony Boy because he was he he, never, he didn't read anything else. You know, I read a lot of Soda Pop in Dallas, mm -hmm. and uh, um, and then ultimately uh, got thrown to the other side of the tracks. I think everyone was well cast in their roles. That that everyone really um, marinated the, those those oh, roles man. really well. You know. Yeah, what a cast, right? What a cast. What a, you know, and and it just goes to show you that if you're willing to do that work, mm -hmm. the cast, because you know, I realized that then later on, most movies you get your five minutes in the room, you know, and you get to read the role, and maybe you'll get to read with somebody else. Um, to, to you know to see if there's chemistry but you know and if it's a tv show you'll you'll go to network you'll do some of these things mm. but for the most part it's it, you know there was not that much work involved in anything that i got afterwards red dawn was probably the most intensive thing after that because we did you know we did some screen tests and i i was there to help screen test to find mm -hmm. uh possible jeds for the movie and things and uh and so that was that was another one that they went out of their way to try, you know, to try to find, uh, you know, a really solid cast, and uh, and I think that shows too with that movie. But yeah, one from the heart. You know, one of the things that I remember the most about going to Los Angeles to do the auditions is, I think it was Fred Roos took me to one of the sound stages where they had built, they had the miniature of Las Vegas, mm -hmm. you know, that was going to do that he had used in one from the heart, and it was, you know, it was mind blowing. It was just. So cool! I love that movie. I thought it was incredible, but uh, but it was maybe a little ahead of its time. Yeah, it's it's a very ahead of its time, interesting movie. So, did you give Randy a backstory when you were preparing? Um, you know, somewhat. I talked to Susie about it. You know, um, we kind of did. I think it was. You know, it was on the page. It wasn't like it needed a lot of filling out. We did a lot. Listen, we did a lot of rehearsal. We did almost a month's worth of rehearsal, um, and that included a lot of time, team building exercise type things to like, you know, bond the socias and and maybe make us a little bit uh, adversarial with the with the greasers. You know, we played football games against each other. We, yeah. you know, they gave us different levels of hotel rooms and and sweats to wear during workout and. Um, and, and the other thing, one of the other things that was very interesting is, is Coppola set all of us up to go spend, uh, you know, uh, a, some time, like a night or two with, uh, with a, a social-like family, 
you know? Yeah. Um, cause I didn't grow up. I, I wasn't, I wasn't, uh, you know, so status in my upbringing and things. I was much more along the lines of a middle class, middle class greaser, you know? Yeah. And, uh, um, so I got to stay in a really cool, uh, house with these really wonderful people. And, and they had, I remember that cable TV, you know, they had the old school cable where, you know, the, with the buttons for every, you know, like 80 buttons and you push them. And I was, I was yeah. blown away. I was like, this is the coolest thing ever, man. So, um, yeah, so they did a lot of work to kind of build us with who they were. But I think one of the things that makes Francis great and, and Fred Roos, who's a, an amazing, you know, when you look at the cast that he's put together, Godfather and some of these other casts, um, I think he does a pretty good job of building on who you are, you know, and, and being able to, give you a role that you feel comfortable in. And, uh, um, you know, so there wasn't a lot of backstory. There was some talk with Susie about backstory. There was some talk with Susie about like where, maybe where they would go after the movie. And, uh, you know, but, but mostly they just kind of threw us into who we were at the moment. Yeah. Did, did, did you read the, uh, the S.E. Hinton book and was there any differences between that and the script? Well, I read the book in, in school, like, like so many people do. I, so, you know, I read the book in school when I found out what the auditions were for after I kind of, you know, I, I read the, like I read the, the, the monologue of Johnny's that they gave us to read initially mm -hmm. and it seems familiar. And then I asked a couple of the friends, the two friends that I'd gone with and they said, oh yeah, it's for the outsiders. And I thought, well, why are they here in Albuquerque? And somebody said, well, they're going to do a, you know, like they're going to do a, a Southwest version of it or something like that. You know, somebody uninformed, obviously. And, uh, um, and I, I just knew that I loved the book. I, 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 I love, yeah, at that point in my life, I was reading everything I could get my hands on. You know, I, I've, mm -hmm. I've always been a voracious reader. And so I, I had read the book. Um, and then, you know, the second day that they called us back there in Albuquerque was a lot of improvisation and stuff like that. I remember doing a lot of improvisation, and I was glad to know the book just a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I, I, well, I think they were very, very true to the book, especially in the longer version of it, you know, the way they, when they put out the original version, they cut the first couple of reels of the movie out. Um, and I, I thought they were very true to it, you know, that, and that's a lot of, because Susie was involved, you know, she was there throughout the process. Wow. Yeah. And you know, it's funny, Matt Dillon was like the biggest star in the movie at the time. Cause he had done oh, yeah. know, over the edge, my bodyguard, little darlings, Tex, you know, and Leif Garrett, you know, he was kind of on his way out as being the biggest teen idol in the world. You know, those two guys were established yep. and the other guys were just coming up. I mean, we don't have to name names, but is it true? A lot of the guys didn't get along. I mean, not really. We, you know, at least not that I saw, but I, you know, again, I was pretty shiny at the time. I was pretty, you know, glittery eyed as far as that goes. But I mean, there was some animosity, but some of it was created, you know, yeah. uh, Lace didn't come into the process of rehearsals until almost near the end, you know, and, and I think that was calculated. Um, I was brought in much closer to the start. So I had formed a bond with some of them. And I think that was calculated too, because I was going to be playing the bridge between the two. And, uh, and, you know, I mean, I, listen, Leif was definitely cast in that role for a reason for, you know, part of it was who he was at the time. You know, he was, I think that Francis and Fred both knew that he would come in with a little bit of that, you know? Yeah. And, uh, but, no, I mean, it was a very tight group of people. We spent a lot of time together. We, you know, we had a lot of fun. And uh, it was really one of the best sets that I've ever been on as far as, uh, you know, we played a lot of practical jokes on each other and, and uh, did a lot of stuff. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, was, it was a great group of people. You know, there was, I think there was some friction between Diane and, and Matt a little bit and, and maybe some friction between Diane and Leif a little bit. Huh. No, and because of some past, I don't, I don't know, I don't know the whole story, yeah. but I knew that, you know, she was fantastic and I got along with her really well and she was so good in the movie and, and, yeah. it, you know, there was a lot of camaraderie between, you know, Emilio and Tom were very good friends coming into the movie, you know, so that, and that, again, that worked out so well. And Rob was a bit too, cause he was from that, you know, that Malibu crowd, you know, and, uh, um, so it, it was, 
the chemistry became clear as because they spent so much time realizing who would get along and who wouldn't. Right. You know? And uh, so it was it was it was a just a wonderful casting process and, and a, a fantastic filming process. I mean, you know, again, I was my first movie, so I thought they would all be like that. But you don't realize what somebody like Francis Ford Coppola brings to to the process of making a film. And it's mm-hmm. it's huge as far as what, you know, he contributes to making it a better experience and a more real experience and a better movie. Right. And did, did he have you read for Rumblefish too? We touched base on Rumblefish. Um, I, for a minute there, there was some talk about, uh, you know, kind of maybe playing the Steve role, the, 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 uh, the, the Vincent Spano role. But, uh, there was an overlap in the movie, in the making of the movie, you know? So I think that for the most part, it, I was working while they were casting it. I was, I was, I was acting. You know, I was, I was in Outsiders. And so there was a, there was a, a, a little bit of some of the pickups and some stuff like that overlapped with them filming Rumblefish. So I, I think, you know, I was more concerned with going back, finishing high school and moving out to Los Angeles. Wow. Yeah, it's funny. Weird Al Yankovic shot his film UHF in the same town in Oklahoma that The Outsiders was filmed, and he jokes about it all the time. He says the movie failed because it got The Outsiders' curse. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, it's a, I love, I, I'm going back to Tulsa early, early February. I love going back to Tulsa. They're just, they're so, we get a lot of love there. You know, the house itself, Danny O'Connor has, has bought that house and turned it back into its, you know, into all, all its former glory, and it's been such a wonderful process to see that happen. I've been back there multiple times, you know, both as fundraisers and just to celebrate it opening and things, and Tulsa's a pretty special place for me. Yeah, local color, as they call it, they gave you guys. Yeah, exactly. I'm sorry the Weird Al didn't have the best, you know, I mean, I... I we, I'm sure that they've embraced him as well, so I don't, I don't know. But it was interesting, you know, when Outsiders came out, that it wasn't, it, you know... It wasn't as embraced as it is now on, on some level because and I, I remember look, watching the movies, you know, the movies that were kind of beating it at the box office were movies like, you know, Porky's and, you know, those kind of movies, right. you know, spring break type movies and stuff. And I think it was a little bit that's a sign of the times. Yeah. And uh, but then again, since Outsiders has this kind of more timeless quality, then it's lasted longer than those those movies have. Right, and also the guys, you know, they all went on to become hugely successful. That's part of it, too, because people can say, oh, let's yep. watch, you know, that early movie with Tom Cruise and Patrick Swayze and all of that. Yeah. Well, and the, and, and the thing that made that, it's, you know, it's, it's a little bit of, you, you know, you can look at it a couple of ways, because one of the reasons, you know, that a Cruise and, and Emilio and all those people were in that movie is because they were so good and worked so hard. I mean... Cruz, right from the start, was you know what he, you knew what he was going to be doing, and that he was going to be he was going to be successful because he worked so hard, you know, mm-hmm. and he was so focused on what it was, and he was he, he was a point of focus for everybody around him, you know. He he took it upon himself to get Rob and he, and myself on on a lot of levels uh, to get us in shape and stuff, you know, especially Rob, he's like, you got to put some meat on those bones, man. You got to, you know, yeah. you to be a greaser fighting a rumble. You got to get out there and, you know, do some work. And so he'd have us out there, you know, running and, and boxing in the elevator lobby and all this stuff. And fantastic human. I had a great time with Tom. And, and every time I've seen him pass that too, um, he's been just a phenomenal human being. So I'm a big fan. Yeah. You're my seventh guest from Joy of Sex. Um, I've talked to oh. Lisa Langwa, Heidi Holliker, Cameron Dye, Danton Stone, McGill Nunez, and Carolina White. Um, wow, was that's that a, that's a roster right there? That was a fun. That yeah. was a fun one. I did that between Red Dawn and and, uh, and Outsiders. It was kind of my first, you know, taste of of working when I came to Los Angeles, and it was so fun. You know, it was a movie that was originally written for. Uh, Belushi and Aykroyd, right? And then, uh, and then Di- Cameron Dye uh, jumped in it. You know, into one of the roles. I've known Cameron now for years, and, and really am a fan of his and his music and things. And and uh, uh, and then I was really the the real highlight of that for me was Martha Coolidge. Yeah. Um, you know, and I met I met on that another you know two of the other actors that were in that Joanne Barron and D W Brown. Right. Um, 
Joanne was one of the best acting teachers in the world. And so she invited me to come to her newly moved. You know, she had just moved out to Los Angeles to open a school. Mm-hmm. So I did the two year program, the Meisner program with her. And, uh, they're still just so successful out here. And, uh, mm-hmm. that was a big, that was a big change for me. So that's probably the, the biggest thing that came out of that for me was that relationship that it really, it ultimately really changed, uh, you know, my thinking on, on, how to act and what I wanted from it. Yeah, uh, but Martha Coolidge, she's very talented, and she uh, did, amazing. She did Real Genius right after this. Did she have you read for that? Yeah, yeah, I read for Real Genius. I, I don't even remember the role, but I love that movie. Yeah, it's it's one of the best teen movies of the eighties. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Jonathan Grise and 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 just <laughs> you know Val. Who I knew, you know, Kilmer and I had the same representative, so I, I, I would run into Kilmer every once in a while, and mm-hmm. I was just like, this, the, you know, just the charisma that he had, uh, especially as a younger man, it was, it was off the charts. Yeah, it was, it's, uh, yeah, I watched his documentary, I had to turn it off after 20 minutes, I just couldn't bear the fact that he can't talk anymore, it was sad. That is rough, that is rough. I had a, an interaction with him, uh, I don't know, a couple of years ago, uh, I was doing a movie that he, uh, I was directing a movie that he, you know, was a possibility of playing one of the roles. Mm-hmm. And, uh, um, I'm just such a fan of his and his work, but it is, it is very hard to see somebody go through that process. It absolutely is. You're my third guest from Red Dawn. I talked to Rodimus Parra last year and I've talked to Pepe Cerda who played Aardvark's dad. Uh, Pepe, yeah, sure. Of course. Yeah. One of the greats. Uh, was that a fun movie to do? Oh my God, please. Are you kidding? I mean, it's like, you know, I, 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 it's, it gets painted with some, like it's propaganda and all these other things. But the truth is, is for us, we were just young kids and somebody said, Oh, you get to go, you know, do a war movie. We were all just out of our heads with the opportunity, you know? And, Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and that process had a great, you know, good, a, a good, uh, uh, audition process, but also a really fantastic rehearsal process because they put us through, uh, through our paces as survivalists and, and, and as, uh, they had this guy, John Early, who, who was, uh, you know, a great, uh, guerrilla warfare, uh, tactician. And we kind of got to put our own costumes together. You know, a lot of those, the way that we looked in that, we built over the process of rehearsals. And, um, you know, they, we got to fire the guns and do the things and play the war and be in the spider holes. And, you know, it was, it was cold and it was tough but it was a blast. And working with Milius had a lot of, he's not similar, he's not the same as Coppola, but he's, a, he's you know, has larger than life like Coppola. He's, he's, you know, he's such an amazing writer mm-hmm. and an amazing director and just such, you know, things were on such a big scale. And, uh, you know, I, like I'll give you an example. I was helping them do the... Uh, I was helping them do the uh, the screen test for for Jet. They were looking for the Jet role, and they were having a hard time finding it. And you know, Charlie Charlie Sheen read for the Jet role. Um, you know, and uh, Ken Olat. I think he's been a guest on your show, right? He oh yes, Jet role. Yeah. Yep. And uh, um, and there were you know there were a few really cool people that read for him. And I was already cast in the film, so John asked me to come in and do the screen test with them. They had built the little a little like a uh, tent, you know, kind of forest setting in at MGM there. And we, we did, you know, old school screen tests, which was fantastic. And it went really well. And John came up to me after the last screen test and he said, Darren, I want to tell you, you're doing, doing really well. I said, Oh, thank you, sir. And he said, I'm going to give you more kills. And I was <laughs> like, I don't know what that means, but I, I didn't say that to him. I just said, thank you and walked away. And then they, during the rewrite process, they had combined, it used to be 10 roles. They combined, they, they, they distilled it down to eight roles. And I, the, the, the uh, Daryl Bates role had grown uh, a little bit more. And so mm-hmm. I guess that's what he meant. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Leah Thompson was the first celebrity I ever met at a convention. And she is such a sweetheart. She must've been great to work yes. with. She was fantastic, and I did another movie with her uh, a few years later called Montana, where we played husband and wife, uh, mm-hmm. and and it was with it was a great cast: Jenna Rollins and Richard Crenna, and uh, Henry Fonda, uh, uh, um, uh, Rick, Rick, not Henry Fonda, but uh, his son. Now my my 
brain is, has left me suddenly. Um, uh, but uh, um, it, it, she's fantastic. You know, I mean, we had so much fun on that. And, and both her and Jennifer had a tough road because uh, Millie is, you know, to put it mildly, is not your, like, yeah. best, like, female female actress, actress, director, I guess is what I'll say. Yeah. He's very, very macho and, you know, uh, Alpha. Well, I, I think they had a tough, but they, you know, both of them really, really just like brought their A game and did some great work and, and, uh, and she's great. And then when I, when I worked with her again, I, I just, I adore Leah. She's fantastic. Yeah. I also forgot to mention, I met Howell at two conventions, um, in the past. He is a, a, such a sweet guy. You know, that's a that's a that's a complete facade. Yeah, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. He's, you know what? Tommy and I have been such close friends. He's like a brother to me. Yeah, been such close friends. You know, for 35 years, we were we were friends on the Outsiders, but he was he was so young and always working. We didn't really get to know each other that well. Um, you know, but once we did Red Dawn, we you know. He and Charlie and I were kind of the three musketeers on that movie. We did a lot of stuff, got in a lot of trouble. And then uh, um, and then ultimately after that movie, then I roomed with Tommy and we had a, we, we made so many projects together. And he's really just one of the best, one of the best, brightest lights in my life. He's fantastic. So I don't get to see him enough. Now he's out running around playing country music and stuff like that. So I don't get to see him enough. But, uh, yeah. but uh, when I do, I'm always happy. Yeah, I haven't seen him do a con in a while. Uh, my friend Tina, uh, who's about who's about twelve to fifteen years older than me, she had a huge crush on him as a teenager in the eighties, and she met up with me at one of the conventions, and it was like, oh my god, the best day of her life. She was in seventh heaven when she met him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Pony Boy, man. I mean, he, he's and he's done some tremendous work over the years. He's just really, you know, he's he's done some great acting work he's a, he's very fun to work with as a director we've made a couple movies as uh, uh, with me writing and him directing and it's been a blast and uh, um, and he's he's great on the set and and you know I I've done a lot of the meet and greet type stuff and cons and, and outsiders yeah. conventions and things like that with him too and and he's you know he's a guy that treats his fans very well yeah that, that secret admirer is probably my favorite of his movies I'm in Secret Admirer. You just got to watch for me. Oh, you are? <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm in Soul Man, too. I, I, I pop up in Soul Man. During that period of time, yeah. we were both doing different things, and we and we would always show up on each other's sets and, like, jump in these, like, tiny little parts and do something, and it was a blast. Yeah, I saw that on your IMDb that you were in Soul Man. I didn't know you were in Secret Admirer, too. That's pretty cool. I didn't even know they gave me credit on soul man i only I, I only played basketball with him one day or whatever i thought that it was an uncredited thing so that's funny it was just uncredited i don't know maybe i i, I haven't listened to the commentary track in a while maybe he points you out in it i don't know that's probably why you ended up on right. imdb <laughs> oh yeah well we we had fun you know i was doing a show for nbc at the time too and i remember him coming there was like a scene in the in the you know it was like a high school thing and, and there was a scene where i was in the bleachers and we were watching a football game and I turned to the person next to me and give him a high five and it was Tommy, you know, and stuff. So we were, we were, we were having a lot of fun at that time. Uh, just kind of like jumping in each other's projects. Yeah. I, 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 we talking about the best of times. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Tammy Lauren, she's a good friend of mine and, uh, Leanne Curtis. I love them both. Oh, love both of those, especially Leanne, Leanne. The end was a blast. We had so much. We played boyfriend and girlfriend, and then we uh, we were boyfriend and girlfriend for a minute there uh, during the process. And she's just a lovely and she <laughs> is a ball of fire. Oh, well, she... Tammy too. Tammy was Tammy was amazing. Yeah. Oh, nothing is sacred with Leanne. Oh God, her sense of humor is great, and Tammy's is too. But Leanne, oh my God, she has no filter. <laughs> oh no, I love that about her. I love that. I you know I couldn't get enough of that. I thought she was she's she's wonderful. Yeah. So why did that show stop after only six episodes? It was what it, it was what was called a mid-season replacement. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, it was it was these great writers. It was the two of the writers that had done a show called Lou Grant for years. Um, it was, you know, I, I just I don't know. There was it was a large cast, and not all of the cast were able to return, and and it just didn't. You know, it was just one of those ones that kind of it 
it happened or it didn't, and it didn't happen. And it's too bad because it was a it was a wonderful cast. I had a great time. It was a great role. I got to play a great role. It was very much more like a greaser role, more closely to what I'd grown up with. Um, I did that pilot. The first day I, I, I had to work on that pilot, I was so sick mm -hmm. with food poisoning that luckily the, 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 the first scene I had up was was shaking down Casey Martell or somebody in the boys' bathroom. Yeah. And uh, it, was, it was a good thing because I was just, I just camped out, you know, just on my knees next to one of the toilets. And then when they'd say, okay, let's get ready, I'd get in place and hold it together long enough to do a take and then dive back in there. I was just throwing my guts up. Wow. God, that's no good. <laughs> how, was, yeah. how was guest starring on Highway to Heaven? Oh, an incredible pleasure. You know, um, uh, Landon was just such a, an amazing human being. Um, it was one of the first times I've been on a show where, you know, the, the, like all of the, his name was on all of the trucks. Right. You know, that's, that's unprecedented. You know, normally, you know, the trucks are rented or they're from Paramount or they're from Warner Brothers or somewhere like that. Yeah. It was Michael Landon Productions on all of the trucks he owned, but he, you know, I mean, I remember talking to him. I think he said that in a, in 40 years, there were two years that he wasn't on a successful series, you know, so mm -hmm. really knew what he was doing. He, his heart was gigantic, um, both in the writing, you know, which I love the script for it uh, and the role I got to play and also in the way that he worked as a director. He was just so much, so much fun to work with. He just It was one of those sets that you showed up really early because you just wanted to be there. And, uh, um, you know, his, he's just a wonderful person to everybody around him. And, you know, one of those guys that could have been in a, in a position to not be that way, you know, he could have mm -hmm. definitely had an ego and there was none. I was very happy. I was very uh, sad to hear, uh, that he passed because he was, I mean, he was uh, an amazing human. Everyone tells me he was like a spiritual advisor. You know, he was, he was very much that character. Oh my God, yes. Yeah. He, yeah. he, he helped a lot. I mean, he, you know, yeah, he put his arm around you and, you know, like, leads you away and talk to you about the scene and stuff like that. And it's just, you know, I, I also think that since he'd done so much acting himself, that he is, he was the quintessential actor's director, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and, and it was, it was, I mean, one of the best directors that I ever worked with did the pilot for the best times. Uh, and that's, and that was Ed, Edward Zwick, mm -hmm. and who went on to do, you know, fantastic movies and things. Glory. And, uh, mm -hmm. and so... What, I'm sorry? Uh, Glory. Oh, yeah, Glory and, and uh, uh, Legends of the Fall and Last Samurai. Right. I mean, uh, and and again, you know, what? A, it's just an incredible pleasure. You work with him, you're working with Michael Landon, you're working with Michael Dinner, all these great... I got to work with some really fantastic uh, directors uh, when I was doing TV. That's awesome. I saw the episode of uh, Cagney and Lacey you were on. I just interviewed Sharon Gless a month ago. She's a great lady. Um, uh, one of my favorite interviews, too. What, what was that like? Yeah. I mean, that was it was a very small role, right? So I think mm -hmm. I only came in for a day or two. and uh, But I was, I was both of those leads in that. I was, so, uh, I, was, I was so in awe of the work they did. You know, Tyne Daly and, and Sharon were just were amazing, you know, it was, it, it's, it, it's always, when you're young and you get to work with people on that level, it's, it just teaches you so much, you know, mm -hmm. and, and uh, just watching them work and working with them was, was such a pleasure. Yeah. You did one of the last episodes of Fame. How was that experience? It was a blast. I mean, first off, it was directed by Debbie Allen, who mm -hmm. was, I loved. And then I got to fence, you know, I got to, uh, I got to do some of the stage combat and stuff that I'd learned in high school, you know, and it, w it was another role where I was kind of playing like a little outside my comfort zone of being the bad guy and being the like student body president type and stuff. Mm -hmm. But, uh, um, but it was so much fun. And, you know, Robert Romanus. Yeah, but and, I know Bob. <laughs> you know, just, oh, Bob was so much fun on that. And, uh, um, it was a blast. De Debbie Allen, especially Debbie, Debbie Allen, was off the charts as far as just just being a, a great director. I really, really enjoyed working with her. Olivia Barash uh, was on there at the time. I've talked to her. Amazing, amazing. Yeah, I mean, we, yeah. we 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 had a Alisa Heinzone. You know, another just really fun cast. Yeah, 
Yeah. I mean, I think the show kind of lost its steam after NBC uh, got rid of it and it became syndicated because the production values got cheaper, you know, but it's still a good yeah. series. Yeah, uh, it was one of those shows that, you know, it was just, it was all, it was too fast. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like the process was too fast and it's one of the things where, 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 uh, um, television can, you know, really used to suffer is that you just went in there and you didn't have much time to do things. Yeah. And, uh, um, and especially whatever you shot towards the end of the scheduled shoot for that episode was usually really rushed. And, you know, cause I know there was like a big sword fight that we practiced for and stuff like that. And then that was on the last day. So they kind of had to like rush through it. And, uh, you know, it was, I think they take a little bit of a different tone with television now where, you know, they, you have to be better, you know, but, mm-hmm. um, but, but fame was a, fame was a fun one. And the movie was such a kind of like a part of my, my growing up, a part of my life. I was, I was really pleased to be part of the series. That's a fabulous movie. Irene Cara, we just lost her. That was sad. <laughs> um, it just, I, I mean, what an amazing talent. I, you know, blows my mind when I think about what she was doing during that period of time between that and flash dance and some of those. Some she, of that music is amazing. She walked away from from fame too. I hope uh, we we we, uh, we we find out why in the future, you know, because she was just so talented, you know. I mean, she got yep. fast, pretty. She got she got. I mean, she got famous pretty fast, you know, like right out of the gate. So it was probably yep. you know it could be a million things. You're my fifth guest from Daddy. I've talked to Stu Frackin, Noel Parker, JJ yep. Cohen, Laura Lee Hughes. Um, anything you remember from that? Oh man, Dermot, you know, Dermot Mulroney, I love, I, you know, just thought, man, this guy's a star. And then uh, Patricia Arquette, I mean, just watching her work was, was a pleasure. Um, we had a lot of fun on that show. It was, a, you know, Stuart and, and I worked on, I, you know, I'd worked with uh, Stuart. I think I, I, I think I worked with him on Quantum Leap as well, right? Yes. Yeah, so we had a, you know, it, it was it, it was a, a great a great shoot as well. Really, really, really good director. Um, you know, kind of one of those very messagey type of movies that they did during at that period. You know, movie yeah. of the week type movies. Uh, but so it was like a little bit of a step above, you know, your normal television in what they were, you know, what they allocated to do it and stuff. But uh, a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Then you do uh, a Freddy's Nightmares episode. I'm a huge Freddy fan, and I've talked to many people who guest starred on the series, and of course, you know, just about everybody from the movies. Um, how was that experience? I mean, I got to be killed by Freddy. Come on, yeah, <laughs> uh, you can't get better than that. But uh, you know, again, one amazing cast: Margaret Mariska Hargitay. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, got to work with her and was just adored her. Jane Mansfield's um, daughter. It was, I mean, it was, you know what, it was funny too on that show because I think I had a much more intricate death and then we, you know, I, like, like I was saying, sometimes you get down to that, those last day or two on a television show and they don't have much time. Yeah. And so they were just like, well, just bring, just bring Robert in and we'll just slash his throat, you know, and I'm like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Robert's a great guy, you know. My uh, my profile uh, picture on uh, YouTube is is me and him. I met him at a con, and he he's just the greatest guy. Great guy, really fun to work with. Just really, you know. Again, one of those people that's just so professional, you know, that you mm-hmm. learn so much from them. That that, uh, but that was a that that was a fun show. I think it was the even it was a Halloween episode or whatever. So it was a little was double the length or something like that but it was it, it was fun to do and ken, ken wiederhorn he directed one of my favorite zombie movies shockwaves right that's funny yeah ken i haven't thought about that for a while yeah how was guest starring on alien nation i mean you know you come in in the morning and you close your eyes because you're tired and then you open yeah. them and you're a potato head you know what i mean yeah <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's it's a bit shocking but it was you know I got to kind of be the, the alien Eddie Haskell, you know, and that was a lot of fun. It was another kind of like Cagney and Lacey where it was one of those roles that you kind of came in and, you know, you were only there for a day or two and it was very quick, but, uh, um, but really enjoyed the makeup process. And those two actors were, were really great to work with. And, uh, you know, it was, it, again, I was lucky. I got, I got to work. I, I don't, I didn't really have many, uh, Especially during that time, I didn't have many 
cast that it was just like, you know, you hated to go to work. It was pretty much, you, I was I was early every day because I loved it. Mm-hmm. You mentioned uh, Quantum Leap. Yeah, I just uh, had uh, Deborah Pratt on here. Uh, she's doing the reboot now. And, you know, this show's got a huge, huge following, even more so than I ever yeah. thought it did. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no. I mean, there's podcasts and things just on that show. I, I, yeah. I've joined them. But another fun role because I got to play that, you know, that radical Abby Hoffman type of, you know, yeah. rabble rouser and things. And, and, you know, not a nice guy, unfortunately. And, but I did get to like you know beat up on Scott Bakula, although he ended up you know, beating up on me more than more so. But uh, um, it was that that was a fun one. That was a fun one. I know you you kind of already had that kind of hair, that kind of Abby Hoffman, you know, well coiffed yeah. hair. <laughs> yes, exactly. It was perfect for you. Yeah. Do you remember anything about Scanner Cop? Yeah, I learned a lot on Scanner Cop. You know, um, Pierre David, I think it was that that's the uh, that he's the director producer. He had a way of working that was really kind of amazing because of the the budget level. And you know, later on when I moved into more independent stuff, mm-hmm. it was really helpful because you know he would have multiple crews going and have multiple things happening, and it was just it was an eye opener with a with a, a possible way to work. Um, Daniel, you know, Daniel Quinn. I mean, it was, it was that, that was, that was a, a, a pretty good time. It's always, you know, any of those ones where you get to, like playing, I played, did a couple movies. I did another one with, with C. Thomas where I played a police officer. Mm-hmm. And, you know, whenever you suit up and all that stuff and put the, you know, the belts on with all the things and stuff like that, you have, you gain a little more respect for police officers and the, the job they have to do because it's, you know, I mean, you're, you're carrying around so much gear and you're putting yourself into those positions and it just makes you kind of go, okay, I see, I see both, you know, where I, I see where some of the traps come here, you know? So it was, it was, uh, but like I said, mostly it was just an eye opener because it was the first time I'd really stepped into something that was kind of like lower budget. Yeah. To protect and serve you're talking about, right? Yes. Yes. And that, and that was a big movie for me because it was one of the first ones that I wrote. Oh, nice. That I did a rewrite on. You know, I did a, a, a major rewrite on it, and uh, it, that was eye-opening for a lot of reasons. Um, but, uh, um, yeah, and working with Tommy, that's always fun. Yeah, what, what made you uh, start writing screenplays? I'd always been a writer. I'd loved writing. I, you know, like I said, I was an avid reader, and I had always written and wanted to write. That was really... I mean, honestly, that's where I was more comfortable. I was more comfortable in that role, and I just kind of, but I got, you know, I spent so much time acting and things like that early in the early years that I didn't get a lot of time to kind of practice that craft. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, once I got the taste for it on a couple of projects, uh, Protect and Serve being one of them, mm-hmm. I was like, okay, this is this is really what I want to do. And um, And so I kind of, you know, the thing about acting is it takes a great deal of commitment. Mm-hmm. So, um, you, you, we talk about these movies for every one of these movies or TV appearances you got to think you know there was like a hundred there were a hundred auditions that went down that I didn't get you know mm-hmm. and so it it at one point I kind of pushed away from it and just said I, I need to I need to focus here to find a voice and be a better writer and so that's what I did yeah, Hourglass. That movie had a pretty good cast in it. It had Ed Begley Jr., Terry Kaiser, who I've met, a oh, wonderful guy. Uh, Johnny Vinegar. Johnny Vinegar, yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, that was just a... We were just figuring out what to do, and that was just... That was one of those kind of Pierre David type thing, low budget, you know, yeah. kind of really creating as you fly. And, and uh, you know, it was the first... I think that's the first movie that, that CT directed... And uh, um, so we were having a lot of fun. It was written very quickly, you know, it was directed and, and, and shot in, I don't know, like 12 days, something like that. So there's no real time to make anything too spectacular, but, mm-hmm. but there is time to, to, you know, to learn a lot and things. So that was, that was a learning experience for me. Are you still acting these days? Some, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely get asked to do some things, some I, some I like to. I can be a little more choosy now, which is great. Yeah. Um, when, you know, some of the stuff that I'm writing or directing, uh, you know, there's there's inevitably that role that, you know, that I end up, you know, jumping into for whatever reason. Um, but uh, but I, do, I do still enjoy it. It's funny, after, 
doing so, you know, doing so much writing and producing and directing, acting seems like such a, more of a vacation, you know, because you have such a singular focus um, that it's, uh, it's, it's more fun, you know? So mm -hmm. it's something I'll probably do more as I get a little older because I'm starting to get the itch a little bit more. Yeah. But, uh, you know, again, my love for acting came from the stage. And I think one of the things that I always missed was not having that experience because there, there's such a different experience being in film and being on stage. And uh, so I may, I may kind of gravitate back in that direction. And you, you do uh, creative consulting? I do creative consulting. I do a lot of script uh, works, whether it's work for hire, or script doctoring, or cons consultation, story consults. And, and now I'm teaching as well. I teach at a really great, the number one, uh, the number one uh, 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 arts high school in the country, uh, nice. the LA County High School of the Arts, which uh, they call LOXA. Um, I teach there, I get to work with young kids, uh, writing and directing, and I really enjoy that. So, I mean, that's something that just kind of kind of happened, but that I realized I, you know, was something I always kind of needed, mm. and uh, so I'm having a good time with that as well. Yeah, you must have done Zoom classes during the pandemic. I did a lot of Zoom classes. I mean, yeah. screenwriting is not a tough one to teach Zoom on. You know, I, I, did, I felt for like the dance teachers and things like that. That had to be a little bit of a tougher challenge. But, but uh, screenwriting was a pretty easy, pretty easy move into that. But yeah, that year was was a was a difficult one for the kids. Um, you know, I, I live up in the mountains above LA, so I do quite a commute down to school when I go down. Mm -hmm. And so it was actually kind of nice to be able to be with my family and. And, uh, you know, just pop on the Zoom at, at 1 o'clock every day. Um, but uh, but I'm glad we're back out. It's nice to see their faces and make some eye contact. Yeah, that must have felt great. Uh, the first day back, you were like, oh, man, I missed this. <laughs> it was a little weird, man. It was like, you know, it took some getting used to being back into it, you know. And then and then ultimately, once, once we were able to kind of move past, you know, always being masked and, ju and just being, you know, fearful of what, you know, what the ramifications might be, um, then it was, it, it was nice to be back. Definitely nice. But like I said, I live, it's a long drive. And if you've done any driving in LA, that's one of the least, you know, that's, I'm sure that there's one of Dante's Inferno's circles of hell was probably driving on the LA freeways. Yeah. And so I, I don't, ex I don't especially love that. Yeah. I've had people drive me on the LA freeway. Yeah. It's no picnic. It's, it's insane. You know? <laughs> yep. Yeah. So no, it's not. It's not for me. Some of the worst. Not for me. It's, it was a tough one. Yep. Some of the worst traffic in the world, man. Uh, do you have anything upcoming you'd like to mention? No, I'm. 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 I'm moving more into some novels. I'm going to be releasing a couple of books. I'm working on my second one right now. The first one's kind of being edited and and going through that process. So that's uh, you know people can take a look for that. Um, but uh, there, there, there are a couple things cooking. There's actually a project uh, that Tommy and I have that uh, that might possibly it looks good for this summer and things like that. So you know, we'll have to jump on again and talk about it. Awesome, awesome, Darren. You you tell really great stories. Thank you so much for coming on today. I really appreciate it. Sure. Thanks for having me. Man. Good luck with everything. Thank you so much. You have a great day. Be safe out there, and you know, Thank you. It, and. Teach those minds. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Okay, you too. Okay, have a great day. Bye-bye. All right, bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Darren Dalton. Ain't he a cool dude? Oh, what a nice guy, huh? And I'm glad that he's teaching and he's writing and him and Howell are still buddies and they're still collaborating. That is just so awesome. You know, you don't hear stories like that anymore of guys you know remaining buddies and collaborating like that it's very rare nowadays in this strange strange world that we live in well until next time this is tommy throwback kovac saying there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks later dudes